Coming up, a segment from KTWU, your source for public television. Afterwards, don't forget to visit ktwu.org to make a pledge to help make more local programming like this. Next, we move on to a story about an animal that's been bred in captivity and then released to the rangelands of western Kansas. It's a story about the relationship between black-footed ferrets and prairie dogs. In December of 2007, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service released 24 black-footed ferrets in Logan County, Kansas. Once native to the state, black-footed ferrets disappeared from Kansas in 1957 and were at one time thought to be extinct. Then in 1981, a colony of black-footed ferrets was discovered in Wyoming. But before long, that colony was decimated by an outbreak of canine distemper. They really had to make a tough decision, which was to go out and take all of the last remaining fer ferrets from the wild, which was 18 individuals, and put them into a captive breeding program uh, for fear that they would have been gone again. And so that's been very successful uh, since 1981. Uh, there have now been over 7,000 ferrets uh, raised in captivity. Uh, a couple thousand of those have been uh, reintroduced uh, into the wild. Black-footed ferrets are possibly the most endangered mammal in North America. They were native to the Western Great Plains and their original habitat stretched from Mexico to Canada. The ferrets' disappearance can be tied to a couple of things. Disease outbreaks, and the fact that black-footed ferrets are almost completely dependent on another Great Plains species, the prairie dog. Ferrets live in prairie dog burrows and eat them almost exclusively. Without prairie dog habitat, the black-footed ferret can't survive. So as ranch land, range land was plowed up to make farmland or converted to houses or as, as cities grew and things like that, took away a lot of the habitat. Also because of the competition with uh, forage grass, there was a lot of uh, el intentional elimination of prairie dogs in the early 19th and early 20th century um, because they compete with cattle for forage. And so there was a lot of uh, poisoning, government-sponsored poisoning and private poisoning and just other, other uh, uh, programs trying to get rid of prairie dogs. And we did a pretty effective job of it. The, the estimation is that there's probably less than 5% of the black-tailed prairie dog occupied range in North America now that there was in the 1900s. Congress has mandated Fish and Wildlife Service, my agency, to try and bring about recovery of endangered species. Because of the complete and total lack of any known wild populations at this time, the only way to do that is through captive breeding and starting new reintroduced populations. At first release in December 07, we put out 24 animals and we split them between the two properties we're working on. We came back then this past fall, um, October and November, and over a series of three different releases, we put out an additional 50 animals, again, sp split between the two properties. To the east, there's the Smoky Valley Ranch owned by the Nature Conservancy, and it's approximately 18, 19,000 acres, on which their goal is to try and maintain somewhere between two and 3,000 acres of prairie dogs for conservation and biodiversity goals. And so we've got some ferrets over there. Um, then we've got a, a group of three landowners here, um, Larry and Betty Haverfield, Gordon and Martha Barnhart, and Maxine Blank, who own this kind of consolidated, it's three properties that are together, sort of in one contiguous block. And we've got ferrets over here as well. We feel fine about having uh, blackfoot ferrets. So we, uh, we want to have blackfoot ferrets. We believe in wildlife. Prairie dogs don't bother us. Uh, we're rotation grazers and uh, we think it's part of the deal to have wildlife along with, uh, uh, with rotation grazing. In order to measure the success of the reintroduction program, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service conducts two ferret surveys per year. Volunteers search the release sites looking for ferrets. And because ferrets are nocturnal, the surveys must be done at night. We've got college students from uh, Kansas State University. We've got, uh, I think, one or two coming here from Fort Hay State University. Um, Audubon of Kansas is represented here. We're going to be using really powerful spotlights, generally typically mounted on the tops of these vehicles, and just drive slowly around through the different pasture units and, and just sweeping the spotlight, looking to see what we can find and looking for eye shine. And then 
we see the eye shine, then we try to get close enough to figure out what kind of animal it is, whether it's a ferret or something else. Because everything out here at night, their eyes glow in the dark. Ferret surveys can be a bit risky. The ground is littered with prairie dog holes, and ferrets aren't the only critters running around at night. Volunteers often come across badgers and occasionally even rattlesnakes. It's tough work out in the dark, bouncing over ruts and sagebrush, uh, looking for those little beady green eyes. I mean, that's the method that you do. You, you look for the eyes and try to see what, uh, what prairie dog hole it goes down when they get spooked. On the night of August 19, 2009, Dan Mulhern of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service spotted a black-footed ferret at 10.30 p.m. A trap was placed over the hole and checked periodically throughout the night. The ferret was finally trapped around 3.30 in the morning and taken to a trailer for examination. The ferret was sedated and scanned for a microchip, similar to the ones used on domestic pets. Information on the chip shows if the animal was born in the wild or in captivity. And this individual turned out to be captive born. He came from the Louisville Zoo. That's where he was captively raised. And he was released here in November of 2008. So he made it over winter. We actually captured him once before in the spring. And then we captured him again. He looked great. He was really healthy. We gave him a shot of penicillin just to boost his immune system for the next couple of days since he was probably stressed out a little bit and we gave him a booster shot of canine distemper vaccine. They're pretty susceptible to canine distemper. Checked his body condition. I pulled off some ectoparasites. We're um, interested in what species live on black-footed ferrets. Took him off the isoflurane and he was back on his feet in about 10 minutes. Once the ferret had recovered from the sedative, he was returned to the same burrow and released. During the week, the survey crew captured seven ferrets and observed 26, including several kits that were born in the wild. But because ferrets are nocturnal and roaming around several thousand acres of land, it's nearly impossible to determine the total population. You can't really say with a high degree of accuracy, but you can tell if breeding is taking place successfully and, and we're finding uh, kits already that have been born on our property that have reproduced on that property. So it's a very good sign. I would hope it'd be successful and uh, I'd hope that we'd maintain the wildlife that we have. All animals, all species have an intrinsic value and it's sort of a slippery slope. If you let one species go, do you let another one go and then another one and then you end up living in a world that's ultimately much less rich both in diversity and um, and in value, I think, if you don't try to keep everything around that's been around, especially things that have, their demise has been at the hand of humans, I think we have an obligation to try and save them. Glad you could stop by to see a clip from KTWU. It's your input that helps make public television great. Consider a donation. Browse over to ktwu.org right now.